Energy Matters Podcast. Hi hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. I am your host, Kasma Lokla from Texas A&M University, Society of Petroleum Engineers. The aim of this podcast is to discuss and explore some specific topics about the energy industry in general and the oil and gas in specific, while covering some related topics in environment, economics, policy, and many more. Today's episode is of exceptional significance as we have the privilege of hosting a distinguished guest, Mr. Travis Stice, the CEO and the chair of board at Diamondback Energy. Mr. Stice will be sharing his valuable insight on Diamondback's accomplishments in the exploration of unconventional resources in the Permian Basin. Additionally, he will delve into his career journey and provide his perspective on the future of energy industry. Mr. Stice, thank you for joining us. It's a great pleasure for all of you here at Texas A&M. Uh, howdy, Alex. Good, good to be with you today, Kasim. Thank you so much. And without any further ado, let me introduce our speaker and then we'll start with the questions. Uh, Travis Stice is the CEO and the director of Diamondback Energy, which is an independent oil and gas company headquartered in Medlin, Texas. Stice joined Diamondback in 2011 as the chief rating officer and was appointed the CEO in 2012. Under his leadership, Diamondback has become one of the most successful and innovative companies in the energy sector. Mr. Stice has 37 years of industry experience and over 28 years of management experience, having held executive position at a number of oil and gas companies, including Viper Energy Partners, Apache Corporation, and Burlington Resources. During his time at Diamondback, Stice has led the company through numerous acquisitions and expansions, including the purchase of Energen Corporation in 2018. Mr. Stice graduated from Texas A&M University with a bachelor degree in petroleum engineering. He is also a registered engineer in the state of Texas, and he is a 37-year member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers. He also serves on the industry boards for different institutions, including Texas A&M Petroleum Engineering Advisory Board and the American Petroleum Institute. Stice is widely respected in the energy industry and has received numerous awards and recognitions for his leadership and accomplishments. Additionally, he's on local community boards for different institutions, including the Midland Memorial Hospital and the Dynamic Catholic Institute. Again, Mr. Stice, thank you for joining us today, and we are glad to discuss some of your career achievements and the energy industry perspective for the future. And now without uh, any further ado, let me start with the questions. And here I will take the opportunity to start from your education. So you graduated in 1985 from Texas A&M University with a petroleum engineering degree. And the first question here, how did Texas A&M influence like the person you are today in terms of leadership, uh, technical aspect, and of course the work ethics? Well, certainly any engineering degree, and I think even to a large degree, petroleum engineering degree back during the time I was at school, and I think it's true even today, really demonstrates you can do two things, that you can work hard and that you can that you know how to think. And I think those are very vital no matter, you know, what company you're working with. The the attributes that I learned at A&M uh, really served me well throughout my here almost 40 year career. That's great. Um, another question here, which is why petroleum engineering and what made you interested in the energy sector especially well i come from west texas a third generation west texas guy and so we really only back in the 80s late 70s and early 80s we only had two choices it was oil and fast food so uh since i was going to college uh, the most logical choice was to be petroleum engineering and uh it, it, it turned out okay for me that's great that's great to hear uh, yeah it's a it's a pleasure to have your name on the top of the leaders in our uh, petroleum engineering department at Texas A&M, and you are one of the idols for all of us here, like students and young professionals. Um, let's move on to your early career. So after graduating from Texas A&M, you started your career at Mobile Oil. And I'm pretty sure that in 1985, it wasn't that easy to land a job in petroleum engineering. So could you please tell us how did you start and why did you choose Mobile? Sure, 1985 was definitely not a good year to get out of college. Uh, petroleum engineering uh, was under you know, attack. We had too many students coming out and the industry was in a contraction phase and jobs are few and far between. And 
And to this day, I still keep my flush letters. I have, a, I don't know, I think there's 35 or so flush letters that I got. And interestingly enough, if you'll bear with me, I'll tell the story that, you know, I have to run to the mailbox and you guys don't even know what mailboxes are every, anymore, but I would run after classes. I'd run to the mailbox every day, post interviews. And, you know, I'd, I'd open up the envelopes to see if anybody was interested in me uh, as an engineer. And we call those flush letters. I think I mentioned that. But what was interesting is that every company came up with creative ways to tell you that you're not worthy of joining their ranks. And uh, Mobile Oil was uh, just another flush letter that I got. It said, uh, you know, not interested in your abilities, however it was phrased. And uh, I just put it in the rest of my reject pile. And then right before Christmas break, I got a letter from Mobile that said, hey, you know, we think you're still not a fit for us, but we're going to we're going to we're going to at least look at you again. Uh, and so that was Christmas break. So I had some tiny bit of optimism uh, during Christmas break that something would materialize on the other side in, in the spring semester. Meanwhile, I'm still accumulating flush letters from other companies as well. And then so it was about February, right after classes started, that I got another letter from Mobile. This is the third letter following a 30 minute interview. And it said, uh, we confirmed it. You're still not worthy of coming to work for us. And I said, I said, man, that's an amazing amount of analysis done, you know, off a 30 minute interview. So I, you know, I, I boldly looked up the, the guy that interviewed me on campus and called his office there in Houston and said, you know, I, here's what's happened. And they said, well, you know, your GPA is, you know, we kind of looking for three fives and above and your GPA was whatever around three or three and change. And he said, we just decided to go another direction. I said, well, you know, I've got great summer experience. You know, I was raised in the oil field, nursed on a pump and tea. I know exactly, you know, what this industry is about and i think i can make you a hand and he says well, why don't you come on into houston and and we'll let you talk to some folks and so i went into you know drove into houston and i talked to some folks and still wasn't particularly optimistic at the time but the pressure was mounting i'd got married my last year of college and uh was run, running out of money getting ready to graduate and i desperately needed a job and and uh probably more divine intervention than anything else i got a call uh back about in late april not too far from graduation and it was uh, a representative from mobile Oil, and they said we'd like to offer you a job in dayton and my wife's in the background here and i said yes right away and i said you know thinking we were going to move to dayton ohio and uh, it was actually dayton on the east side of houston but the reason i share i share with you that story and there's a degree of perseverance in there uh there's a degree of there's a degree of of um, you know making sure that you follow what it is you believe you dream in and and don't take no for an answer and mobile was a fantastic company to work for i worked for worked for them for five years uh, and they gave me a chance to get started and i'll always be indebted to them but if we were in person i could show you still the flush letters and i've gone through there and i've highlighted each of those flush letters from the different companies about you know how they told me that uh, that i wasn't worthy to join their ranks so a little bit of motivation um, but certainly a, a perseverance and, and chasing in what you believe in. And, and granted, I had a higher degree of desperation maybe than most. But uh, like I said, I think it turned out OK. Wow, that's really like inspiring. And like anything in life, it takes passion and perseverance, as you mentioned. And yeah, like it always starts from the bottom to the top. And yeah, thank you for sharing this story with us. Um, after a few years at uh, Mobile, uh, you moved to Burlington resources. So what made you pivot to another company at that time and why Burlington specifically? Well, Mobile Oil had just merged with Superior and there was a lot of Superior folks that uh, were leaving Mobile at that kind of my fourth and fifth year of career. And while I didn't realize it, and this is another piece of advice, while I didn't realize it, those individuals that came from Superior that ultimately were leaving and going to Burlington Resources were paying attention to my career, even though I was an early career professional. And so those guys had left Mobile Oil and had you know, really started this with, with Burlington to, to grow that enterprise. And they reached out to me and I had such tremendous respect for those individuals, even though I had a lot of loyalty, as I talked about for Burlington, I mean, for the mobile oil organization, you know, I, I really felt felt like a smaller, more nimble uh, oil and gas company like Burlington uh, was a better fit for me. 
uh, than mobile was at kind of year five in my career. So prayerful consideration, uh, but I made the change and, and moved over to Burlington Resources, which you know was a fantastic company to work for. And uh, you know, I learned a, a tr- you know, I learned most of the things that I've applied, you know, over the last 20 years of my career from the almost 20 years I worked f- for Burlington Resources. So a fantastic company. Yeah, completely. I, I totally agree with you. And we always need to challenge ourselves and not to stay in our comfort zone. And talking about um, changing companies, after Burlington Resources, you were at ConocoPhillips, Apache, and Laredo at different positions. So were these carefully planned career stepping stones or were they just like opportunistic positions? Yeah, the ConocoPhillips position, I had nothing to do with that when they came in and they bought Burlington Resources. So, uh, you know, I, I went I went to fortunate, to, you know, fortunately, I went to work with Con- for Conoco after the Burlington acquisition. And another observation I had at the time was not everyone got the privilege or opportunity to go to work for Conoco as they were putting the two companies together. And and while there were probably people that could, you know, were better leaders than I were, or people that might have been better, you know, um, uh, uh, traditional engineers, I think one of the things that helped me merge into Conoco effectively was keeping a real positive attitude. I'd always had an attitude about, you know, whatever it is you want me to do, you know, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability, but I'm going to do it with a positive attitude and, and try to bring those around me up to that same level of same level of, of high attitude. And and that really made a difference, I think, as you know, as I look back on it, that, you know, some people were rightfully disappointed that they, you know, that the company they loved, Burlington, was no longer. And I was one of those, but I immediately adjusted my attitude to to try to be successful at ConocoPhillips. And I really stayed on with, with ConocoPhillips for you know, almost three years, you know, really trying to influence you know what I could in the in the arena that I had on how to develop unconventional resources, you know, in a more nimble way, more cost effective way than most super majors were thinking about unconventional resources. And and then you know and then I segue out of out of ConocoPhillips back to that more nimble. That's when I started with the private equity. I had a little stint with the with Apache in there, but started with private equity in you know in 2010. And had a couple of fits and starts. And again, you know, those weren't perfect starts. And, you know, one of those jobs ended what I would say very unceremoniously, but again, with a good attitude and convinced that I still had, you know, some some gas left in the tank as a 50 year old guy. That's what actually led me to, you know, to Diamondback Energy, where we got it, where we got it started back in 2011. Right. This is a great tip. So, yeah, a couple of things here. Uh, so were there any roles during the time consequential to your latter success running Diamondback? So were there some instances that really made you into like, what you are now as a leader in the industry? Yeah, you know, I, I certainly believe that that uh, I recognized pretty early on in my career that I wasn't going to to spend my whole career as an individual contributor, you know, a technical expert. There's some that are and that, that are incredibly gifted at that. I didn't fall into that category. In fact, I was in the half of the class that made the top half possible. So, you know, I, I knew that, you know, traditional academics, with, you know, academics and engineering weren't going to be my, my full career. And so I pivoted into to leadership. And again, I think my attitude about um, about lead, about you know, doing job, doing my job, and in elevating those around me, sort of separated me from, you know, the pack that where people could recognize, well, hey, this guy's got a great attitude. People seem to willingly follow him, and even though he doesn't have an organizational authority, if people are, you know, following him, that makes a good leader. So in 1993, I got my first chance to be a leader, and and what I recognized then is that at that point in time, you know my career trajectory was now going to be a function of accomplishing results through others and that's really what a leader is but there was something that happened in i believe it was 1993 maybe early 94 that i recognized that i needed a shift in my thinking about how i was going to be a leader you know traditionally i was always thinking about well here's what i accomplished and then you know and then as i moved to where i was supervising others I was focused on, OK, I'm taking their results and I'm making a mind and I'm presenting those results as here's what I've accomplished through the team that I was responsible for leading. And 
I recognize that that was exactly opposite the way you need to think about things. You know, when you talk about accomplishing results through others, it's now less about you and it's more about the results from other people. So when I made that mind shift and we didn't realize it at the time and I didn't use the phrase at the time, but that really was the onset for me in my career where I adopted wholeheartedly the concept of servant leadership, where I'm actually there to serve you know, those organiz the individuals in my organization and try to help them be as successful as they can, because it's only in them being successful that would translate to my success. And so that actually was a trajectory changing realization I had, you know, in, in early 1994. Well, that's really impressive. Yeah, now you are on the top of one of the largest companies uh, here in the premium basin which is Diamondback Energy. So if we want to switch gears and start talking about Diamondback Energy, which is an independent oil and gas company had acquired in Midland, uh, responsible for acquisition, development, exploration, and exploitation of unconventional onshore, onshore oil and gas in the Permian Basin. So you served as the president and the chief operating officer from April 2011 to January 2012. And then in 2012, you started your current position as the chief executive officer and director of Diamondback and back. So an important question here, what makes Diamond Back unique from you? Um, yeah, I want to, you mentioned that transition from 2011 to 2012, and I'll get to your question about what makes Diamond Back unique, but there's a, there's a point in there that I think is, is really useful for your listeners uh, that are going to be spending their whole careers in, in this industry. And I became CEO in 2012 because that's when we we're going to take the company public. We went to the SEC, got our registration paperwork filed, and we were getting ready to launch the uh, the IPO, which means you go on the road and you talk to a group of investors for you know two weeks, and you sell a portion of the company to the public, and you use those funds to to you know to execute your um, your development plan. Well, right before we got ready to do that, Facebook had just gone through an IPO, and it was a a, a very unsatisfying process for the marketplace and effectively it, it closed the window for you know all ipos including diamondbacks but what the problem was is that we were out of money we were fully drawn on our bank line and the private equity providers said we're not funding you any more money meanwhile i'm running five or six drilling rigs i got lease expirations that are you know that are predicated on you know getting wells drilled and we don't have any money and so we've pivoted to try to sell the company, which is not uncommon. It, it sounds more extreme, but that's not uncommon because you've got all the data in the IPO as if you would try to sell the company. So we marketed the company uh, for two weeks, you know, after that failed start of an IPO. We can't call it a failed IPO because we never we never hit the market with it. But we marketed the company to eight different, you know, energy entities uh, over a two week period. And the day came where we opened the envelopes up to see what kind of valuation we would get for the assets that we were in, in control of at the time. And we went 0 for 8, which means not even one of the eight companies submitted a bid for us. That's how we reviewed, honestly. And that was that one singular day was the darkest day uh, of my of my professional career when I had to go back to you know the friends and colleagues that were working with me and saying, you know didn't the sales process didn't work out either so we did uh we did borrow 30 million dollars from our private equity company we waited until after labor day when the ipo market opened back up and we uh we uh we took the company public doing about three thousand barrels of oil a day and about a 500 million dollar market cap and today we've we've gone through what can only be described as meteoric growth and we're we're, you know, somewhere around 260,000 barrels of oil a day and uh, and a market cap or market value of close to $30 billion. So over a 10 year period that that represents quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of growth. But the reason I wanted to share that story, there's certainly no bragging involved in that, but it's that determination again, you know, that failed process. Uh, much like those flush letters that I had to endure uh, when I was getting out of college, you know, set my jaw with, um, you know, with with uh, with a chip on my shoulder that we were going to make this thing work. And again, kind of that common theme of, of perseverance in the face of pretty extreme odds, you know, prevails again. 
And uh, certainly this is not just a unique thing to Travis. I had an incredibly talented group of individuals around me that uh, we're all at the very top of their game and we're making this we're making this possible. So I wanted to share that story with you. But you asked me about what makes Diamondback unique and our business model. And I'm going to say this as simply as I can, because I think it's important to stay simple here. We take rock and we convert it into cash flow and we do so as efficiently as, as we can. So our mission is to produce barrels at the lowest cost and the highest margin with the lowest carbon footprint, which that lowest carbon footprint has evolved over the last couple of years. But that's really what we do is in the process of producing those low cost, high margin barrels. That's all we're doing is converting rock into cash flow. Now, we've been very successful over the last 10 years of also identifying value in rock that others didn't and acquire. We've been a very acquisitive com company, you know, over the over the last uh, 10 years, and that's certainly a that's certainly a skill of ours. But at the end of the day, I don't complicate it any more than than getting good rock and turning it into cash flow. And every step along the way of that conversion process is vital because it creates greater margin or lower cost. And in a commodity based business, which the oil and gas business is, we don't control the price of the product I, that we produce. You've got to be you've got to be low cost. And I learned that very on very early on in my career. If, if I was going to be the last person standing in, a, in the oil and gas business, the only way I could do that is to be a low cost producer. And today, you know, Diamondback still prides itself in being the low cost producer here in the Permian. All right, that's really impressive. Yeah, and thanks for, sh first of all, sharing your story. It's so motivational. And yeah, thanks to your leadership skills that made Diamondback at the top of the game. Um, you saw so you talked about the business model and some of the technical aspects related to Diamondback, but if you want to comment on the working environment, the culture inside the company, and how do you motivate your, your employees uh, to continue in achieving their goals and the goals of the company in providing secure and affordable energy at the lowest cost? Well, everybody has to have a purpose and your, your job, you have to have a purpose for it. And, and you have to find you know your spot in the value creation change and that creates the purpose for you you have to be recognized for what you do well and you have to be compensated and rewarded for what you do well and so all of those things have to line together but i'll tell you differentially differentially you have to communicate in a way that provides a line of sight to every employee in the company that what they do on a day-to-day -day basis an hour-to-hour -hour basis how that translates into value creation for the shareholders who own the company and i spend a lot of my time you know thinking about how to make that uh, translation and and thinking about how to make sure that our employees feel that they're a part of the success not just a part of a big machine and one of the ways that we've always strived is to keep a real flat organization and what i mean by that is that we don't create silos in our organization you know we create you know, very a very horizontal organization where we sort of operate at the speed of trust. You know, everyone has to trust each other that they're making the right decision for the company. And I've worked for larger companies and the larger companies typically migrate towards more of a siloed function where you have silos that go up and then at some level decision makers get together and talk about it and then it comes back down the silo. That's not how we wanted to build down and back. We wanted, you know, from the CEO's level to the, you know, to, to the, you know, first, you know, first line contributor in an organization to be very, very flat. And we wanted accessibility to all management and we wanted everyone to feel a part of that family. Now, we started with with uh, five people in the company back in 2011 and today we've got almost a thousand. So the challenge to keep that mindset has gotten more difficult for me as we've gotten larger but again if you don't make it too complicated you know you just you know what gets rewarded gets done you try to be very clear on what your values are as a company and the character you want the company to demonstrate and that character is made up by the character of the individuals that you choose to come to work for for you so it all really it all at the end of the day it all ties together in, in my world and that's that's kind of how i think about it yeah, I totally agree with you. Involving the employees, all of them, and including them in the process of developing the company and 
letting them know that they are part of the success of the company and their work really matters is very important and this will keep them motivated all the time and so if you want to comment on this like we as a student chapter we're a small organization here we're not compared to companies but we also do the same in encouraging members to take roles like simple roles in volunteering or a organizing a type of event, a sport game or anything, but this motivates students when they see that their role or their uh, position in a certain period of time will help like make Texas A&M or the Society of Petroleum Engineers recognized and like at the top. So yeah, I totally agree with you. Thanks for sharing this. And I uh, think if I could just add to that because you raised some good points, you know, as you guys leave the halls of academy, academia and actually step into the real work work world you know i think it's important that you recognize that you've got to figure out what your what your purpose is you know you have to figure out you know what it is that you're going to contribute to you want to be a meaningful specific versus a wandering generality i've seen a lot of students that come out that don't that don't either they have not don't have a mentor they've never been you know they've never been in a situation where you know they've they've been asked to define what their purpose is or in some instances organizationally they give you the purpose but find what your pur- find what your purpose is and then do it to the very best of your ability and don't just bounce around from one general thing to the next general thing be a meaningful specific versus a wandering generality well this is a great tip for all of the students um thank you so much and now let's let's move to another topic which is the energy industry, the challenges and the future outlook. So currently uh, we are hearing a lot of terms that are related to energy transition, energy evolution, energy addition, and so many terms. And one fun fact here is that the oil and gas industry has never been so criticized, in particular regarding to the climate change, like it has been in the recent years. So I just want your uh, comment on the future of the energy industry, maybe in the next five to 10 years. What are some of the challenges? Are we gonna get rid of the natural gas and oil as one of the major resources for energy? And are we gonna like completely do the transition into other types of energy such as renewables, geothermal, and so on? You know, I certainly believe that all forms of energy are going to be needed. We've got 8 billion people on the planet right now. You know, a billion and a half to 2 billion people live in energy poverty and a billion people live on the brink of starvation every day. And, and the, you know, the way that you lift people out of those circumstances is with abundant and affordable energy. I mean, if, if we got a billion people that are using biomass to heat their huts and, and cook their foods and, you know, warm their 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 huts you know a a 20 pound bottle of propane would change their world you know i i I think all of the above needs to happen it's really an energy expansion we're doing 100 million barrels a day roughly as a world today consuming 100 million barrels a day uh in the world and we're going to be that number is going to not do anything but go up for the next decade i don't know what the number is going to be i'm not a an energy forecaster, but I know what it is that we do. And I also know that, you know, companies in the United States produce some of the most environmentally responsibly produced barrels and socially produced barrels in the world. And I think the combination of those means that the barrels that we produce here in the United States should be the preferred barrel on the world stage. Now, other forms of energy, like I said, all of it needs to come into the equation. And look, I want my grandkids to be raised in a world where they don't have to worry about, you know, you know, uh, global warming. They don't have to worry about, you know, uh, uh, poor air quality in the air in the in the cities where they live and work. And one of the ways to do that is to is to find a way to supplement dense hydrocarbon generated energy with other forms of variable energy like wind and solar. I, I do think, though, you have to look at the entire supply chain of all energy that gets provided. You know, uh, solar panels, the cobalt that's being, you know, mined by hand, uh, you know, in 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 uh, sub-Saharan Africa and the Congo. You know, you, you need to be very aware of all of the elements that go into, you know, wind turbines and, and solar panels. All of them are needed 
But let's not be naive that in some instances those are being mined in the most extreme uh, conditions. Uh, again, that's back to my socially produced barrels that we do here in the United States. I do think it's a fair question in today's world that students ask, am I going to have a business to be, you know, a business to be uh, to retire in or am I going to have to look at transitioning away from my career? I'm absolutely convinced that we're going to be producing hydrocarbons for the next 50 years and in probably numbers well higher than what we're even doing today because energy transition is just so hard unless there's some fantastic innovation you know that break that creates a breakthrough and if that's the case that's probably better for the whole world anyway but you're going to have a long and illustrious you have the opportunity to have a long and very illustrious career in the energy industry as we have it today um, unfortunately for the last 20 years most of us in the energy industry relied on almost a moral obligation to do what it is that we did and in the process we seeded the narrative to one that was really magnified during COVID in 2020 is that the world can do without traditional oil and gas, which we now know is not the case. One observation is, is looking at what Europe's going through right now, particularly Germany. I think they've spent somewhere around $500 billion over the last you know, uh, 20 years you know, trying to transition away from uh, uh, oil and gas, and, and they've taken their energy consumption from somewhere around 84 percent down to 79 percent anyway i may not have the numbers exactly precise but they've spent a lot of money to not make a very big difference and they still now enjoy the highest energy costs in, in almost all of europe so it's not an easy solution all of it needs to be done but we need to make sure we're investing in innovative technologies that allow less dense energy creation like wind and solar to become more efficient so that it can can compete with oil and gas, uh, not only economically, but also, you know, for, for the betterment of, of those that need it uh, around the world. Awesome. I really appreciate the comment and I totally agree with you. And I believe that oil and gas companies can play a role, not only in providing energy security, but also can play a role in achieving um, uh, not only like net zero emissions, but also like try to maybe capturing some of the emissions underground. And this uh, like is one of the approaches that money companies are now targeting. We need to minimize, just to be clear, we need to minimize any methane that gets into the atmosphere because we know beyond a, beyond any, you know, beyond any needed proof that methane in the atmosphere traps more heat. We also need to, to do a better job on our emissions, which means we don't let even burned gas, you know, ultimately emit. I don't know that we can ever reach a true uh, net zero without some form of, you know, carbon offset you know, investment in technology, but very definitely we need to we need to do more. And if you just look at Diamondback specifically, you know, we've got a goal from measure measurement point 2019 to 2024, where we re reduced our methane intensity by seven over 70 percent and uh, our GHG gas emissions by 50 percent and over that same five year period. And so we're more than halfway through there, but we're also more than halfway through our target. And that's not an end point. You know, that's 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 just the journey and we're measuring ourselves and holding ourselves accountable for uh, for those uh, emissions reduction targets. That's perfect. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And as we are approaching the end of this uh, talk, which is really impressive and so insightful, um, most of the students who are uh, listening to us will be petroleum engineering students, energy engineering students who are really like interested in joining the industry, going to the field, work uh, like maybe on the rig or uh, in the office, different types of disciplines in the oil and gas industry. And they are always looking to industry leaders like you as role models, and they want to see their guidance or seek their guidance and advice. So just like if you want to simplify it in few sentences, what advice you have for the aspiring petroleum engineers or energy engineers? What skills they need to have? What what dreams they should have as they are graduating very soon? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm going to sound like a dad here because I am a dad and a granddad now, but I'll tell you in my experience, and this has been an evolving thing for me to realize this over the last you know 20 years or so, your character becomes your destiny. And so, you know, the great failures in our industry and in our society are not usually failures of intellect, 
they're not failures of opportunity you know they're failures of character and that's what i mean by your character becomes your destiny and i think it's really important as you transition from a student to one that's in the industry whether it's the energy industry or anything else is that you stay mindful of your character development and the way that you develop a good character is by developing a habit around virtues you know we all know what the good virtues are you know uh, kindness and humility um, be a practicer of virtue developer the uh, virtues and virtues lead to character and character leads to your destiny i'll also tell you that from a professional perspective you know when you get out you know you got to know how to play nice with people in the sandbox you know when, because there's no longer a world where you know you're just an individual contributor you know in an office you know everyone has to collaborate and the ability to communicate ideas succinctly articulately the ability to um, elevate those around you because of your own performance uh, is, is really important so you know be the best at whatever it is you're doing at the time in front of you don't worry about what the you know what the future holds worry about what you can control and you know i like to say you know as you as you leave academia and go into the workforce that that first five to ten years is really what i call the learn period that's when you're learning how you're going to contribute for the majority of your career so it goes from learn to earn you know because the more you learn early on in your career the more you're going to be able to earn you know when it really matters you know because i get a little frustrated with you know with with uh you know early career professionals that they'll leave a job one job for another job because it pays them three thousand dollars a year more i you know what you should be worried about is is how can i learn more so that i can earn three million dollars more you know when i move to that earn phase so focus on learning early in your career and then that earning will be a lot greater on the on the back side. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it makes all the sense. Thank you for sharing um, your advice. And also, I really like the learn and earn strategy. Uh, I think with this, we come to an end to the uh, discussion today. I think it has been an excellent discussion, and I'm confident that everyone will find it very informative and engaging. On behalf of Texas A&M University Society of Petroleum Engineers student chapter, I extend my sincere gratitude for you for taking the time to join us today. Leaders like you are our motivation and like our role models so that we always look into you and see your leadership and follow your steps in order to be also leaders in the future. So I wish you and Lemon back all the best in the coming years and also in continuing the legacy of the company in providing affordable and secure energy to both the United States and the world. Thank you for your time and I really appreciate it. God bless and gig them. Thank you so much.